So up next we have Nick Moore. He's, well, the Emperor's New Closure Functional Programming in JavaScript. So take it away, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, my name's Nick Moore. I'm a consultant. I write HTML5 code for my sins. Um, I find it helps me not be, have to live in a barrel by the side of the road with a begging bowl, so I'm not all that repentant about writing JavaScript. Um, it's a language with many features. Uh, the bad ones have been covered extensively in the literature and in presentations and conferences. So I'm just going to skip over those and we'll just take them all as read. Um, I'm not going to really worry about those things. I'm also not going to really talk about the many, many libraries that are available because they are, there are very many of them to choose from and I think it's important to understand the fundamental things underneath them as well if you're going to use them or if you decide not to use them. I'm also not really worrying here about ES6 or ECMAScript 6 because it's not really widely available on the kind of platforms I have to deal with. Um, I will greatly enjoy the day when it is universally available, but until then, we're stuck without its new exciting syntax. Um, I'm also not really worried about its prototype OO system, which I haven't really found all that useful. Perhaps this is more of a, a matter of uh, spending a lot of time dealing with user interface -y kind of code and kind of glue logic and stuff like that, but I've generally found that a big towering heap of OO abstraction is just not something that's part of my day-to-day -day excitement about the language. Um, and I'm not really looking into this whole kind of compiling more interesting languages to JavaScript. Um, I'm, I'm terribly keen on the idea. I think it's really exciting, things like haste and so on and so forth, to compile Haskell into JavaScript and various other languages into JavaScript. I think they're great ideas and absolutely will shout the author's beers any time, but uh, I'm not really talking about that today. I think it's important to remember, as per Katie's statement at the start, programming in JavaScript doesn't make you a bad person. You may have just made some bad life decisions and <laughs> got there that way. So, you know. so um, this is kind of preaching to the converted for some people here. I'm, I'm not sure. Just, to, just out of interest, in the room, how many people are like JavaScript people? And how many people are like full-on functional programming people? I'm just going to take your hand as red, right? So it's a mix. OK, cool. Um, so functional programming, what does it really mean? Uh, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, but the most important things, I think, are the idea of functions as first class parts of your language. They're not their own separate little class of thing like they are in some languages. You can pass them around. You can put them in a variable. You can put them in a list of functions. You can have a list of functions. You can have a dictionary of functions. You can pass them to functions, and you can get them back from functions. <laughs> A higher order function is a function that you can write that takes another function or returns another function. And we'll see how those things are, are useful as we go along. Functional programming tries to push you towards this idea, and in many languages it enforces this idea, that functions should be kind of small and kind of pure. They shouldn't have a lot of global state. They shouldn't go around changing the universe on you. Uh, if you were here for, for previous lectures, you would have seen that uh, a fair bit, where we've talked about functions as very pure things. They don't have an ability to talk beyond their own scope. Um, it, to the extreme case, they may not even have any way to understand their beyond scope because there are no types anymore. But, you know, um, there's some nice things about that. It means it's, it's very easy to reason about them. You can, you can look at what a function looks like it does and be pretty sure that it's going to do it again. You can optimize very easily. If you use the same function twice with the same parameters, it's always going to have the same output. So you can optimize that away. And you can unroll things, and you can tail call optimize things. You can do all sorts of things because of this limitation. In some ways, the limitation you're accepting is making your job slightly harder and more abstract and requires a little more homework. But it's making the compiler's job a hell of a lot easier. And that's a really interesting aspect of this stuff. Um, and there's an emphasis on composing functions. So rather than writing giant big functions that do everything you want at once, you're trying to write lots of little functions that are easily testable. You can compose them up into achieving the task you want to achieve. Is JavaScript a functional programming language? No. 
Um, this is occasionally debated and people say, oh, it's the successor to Scheme and various other exciting things. And Brendan Eich once hit his head and had a vision. And it was Scheme. And then it became JavaScript. It's not. It's, it's very different from a full-on functional programming language. But it does have first-class functions and it does have higher order functions. So you can write a function and pass it around and you can write functions that take functions and pass them around. Purity, it does not have. Every single JavaScript function can talk to, uh, in the browser, there's the whole document object model, which is like your web page as rendered. They can talk to all these global variables. They can talk to the entire internet. This is a long, long way from a pure function and there's no language segregation of this. And I'm gonna use this word exactly once in my talk. There's no IO monad. I won't say it again, right. There's no separation of the concept of this is I.O., this is pure. So you, you are stuck with what you've got. Because of that, it's very limited in what optimization it can do. None of the mainstream JavaScript engine do tail call optimization or other things you might be expecting if you wanted it to be a f uh, functional programming language. But we can work around a lot of that. Can we benefit from using these functional techniques in JavaScript? Who's, who's maintained legacy JavaScript code? Anyone? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Uh, we happy few. Um, we've survived, so that's nice, but it is very difficult often because you'll find that the code tends to enormous functions that do all sorts of things and they manipulate state over here and they talk to the internet over there and they do some other stuff and they return some stuff and there's no type system so you're not even sure what it is. We can move away from that. Unfortunately, the compiler or the interpreter or whatever isn't going to discipline us like Haskell would, but we can have a bit of self-discipline and make ourselves, force ourselves into this, this thing. Um, a, a bit like a uh, previous talk about um, polymorphic types, it's, it's not necessarily something that's enforced on you, but it's a, a discipline you can decide to use. And if you have a code review process in your company, it's a really good thing to discuss a lot in the code review stuff. Is this, are we being sufficiently nice in our code. Are we being nice to it? Are we being excellent to each other <laughs> in our coding as, as well as everything? More to the point, are we going to all be talking about each other at lunch breaks once we've gone about that thing Nick did, that thousand line function that does stuff, no one's sure. All right, the techniques we really need to use, the, the, using these te le techniques, sorry, lets us eliminate repetition because if you've seen a lot of boilerplate JavaScript, there's a lot of stuff there where you're going loopy, 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 loop around. It lets us get rid of a lot of that stuff. It lets us reduce our variable scopes enormously. And the smaller a variable scope is, the less kind of danger you're getting from this piece of state that's floating around. If you can encapsulate that as small as possible, it's a lot easier to reason about the behavior of your code because you know that, that you look at this function, all the variables it's using are local to it, so you know what it does. You know it's gonna do the same thing next time even if you're on a different state of the universe. We can prefer these very pure functions and try and say, well, let's segregate our pure functions from our nasty IO using talking to the internet functions, talking to the DOM functions. All right, practically, that was the pep talk. The practical side of things are there are a bunch of built-in higher order functions these days, which is excellent. As I said before, higher order functions are functions that take functions. We talked about fmap before. This is the, the, the JavaScript equivalent is map. You can write yourself, a, you can take a list of things, take each element of that list, pass them through a function and reassemble those into a list. That's what a map is. It's basically saying for each member of this list, do something to it, make me another list of the return. Now it doesn't look like that much excitement, but you've gotten rid of a for loop, which means you've gotten rid of one more chance to stuff up the ends, the bound conditions of, of the loop. You've gotten rid of one more little bit of confusion. It's made things a little tiny, tiny bit simpler, one tiny thing at a time. You can also use these sorts of built-in higher order functions with your own functions. So reduce takes a list and it takes the first bit and it reduces it down and then the second bit and reduces it down again and again and again. It's kind of like boiling things down. You end up with one result out of a big list. So this thing, we take a function add that just knows how to add two numbers together. We run it through this list of numbers and at the end we found the, the total. That doesn't look terribly useful, I admit. 
But you can imagine if each of these functions are a little bit more complicated and slightly too big to fit on this slide, the clarity in being able to look at it and go, oh yeah, I can see that. We take, this function takes this and this, and then we just reduce over the list. It also kind of separates our concerns. We have the reduce function is responsible for the job of going through the list bit by bit. The add function is responsible for finding a total. They're separate now. So if we wanted to change the list into some other kind of data structure, we can. We can use the same add function. And imagine the add function was doing some kind of more advanced statistical kind of analysis -y thing. We can use that same statistical analysis function to run over a list of six elements or an iterator of a billion elements. And this comes up with the, the, some of the really exciting um, life sciences talks we've had, talking about parsing through DNA and all of that sort of stuff at the, at the other mini-conf. This sort of stuff comes up. They're, they're dealing with billions and billions of records and running through those lists. So it's, it's a separation of concerns that might seem trivial in the trivial example, but it's actually kind of a useful thing to be able to do. There's some other higher order functions like every and sum and uh, filter and for each and all that stuff. They're all just little shorthands for things that you could be doing with a reduce, but they're very useful. They make your code very readable. If, every, if numbers dot every is odd, I think is a very, very clear way to say, are all these numbers odd? As opposed to for var i equals zero, i is less than numbers dot length i plus plus, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, that code happens, but it's harder to read. Once you get used to it, it's not that much harder to read, but every little tiny bit you can improve your code helps when it's doing something awful to you. The other really nice things about this is that you can compose a lot. So you can say, look, don't do everything at once. Let's just compose a little pipeline of operations. And, and we saw that with the, the Python talk. So you can make a little operation for adding. You can make a little operation for squaring. You can make a little operation for finding the kurtosis of something or another, if you happen to know what that is. You can do all of these funny long things. And as long as you get those definitions themselves correct, and you can test them really easily because they're very small, you can then chain them together in a big long pipeline and do something silly like finding the sum of the squares of all the odd numbers. Don't know why you'd want to do that, but you know, that kind of example. And yeah, real programmers can write forth in any language, but you know. Now, the other time that this comes in really handy is that JavaScript is by nature asynchronous. There is no sleep in JavaScript, right? There's just, there isn't a sleep. You can't tell the thing, wait, and now let's go. What you have to do instead is say to it, set a timer. Call, me a, call a function when you're done. When the timer goes off, call a function. There's no way to say, hey, just, just hold everything until someone presses a button. Instead, you say, hey, button, call me back when, I've been, when you've been pressed. So this is an example up the top. We say, find the button called foo. And when it's clicked, call a function called foo click handler. This next one here is saying, all right, open an uh, XML HTTP request, which is an Ajax call, basically. When something changes, call me back. It's a very, it's actually, when you think about it, it's not that weird. It's a bit like what you do if you were sending someone out to go and get something for you, to do a job for you. You say, hey, look, can you go down to the shops and call me when you get there and tell me what's there, and then I'll tell you what I wanted, and then you can get it for me and call me when you get back, right? It actually makes a lot of sense. Every time you're, you're cooperating, your co-routining, in fact, with the other person. It also means that your code can do multiple things at once because it can have multiple things out in the field looking for things for it. And even to just wait for five minutes, you have to set a timeout and say, call me back in this many milliseconds. So working out the details of what happened, though, can be kind of complicated. If all you're doing is setting an on-click handler on a button and that handler gets called, you're pretty sure that button got clicked, right? But sometimes it's less obvious. So, oh, hang on. Sometimes it's less obvious. Sometimes you might have the same handler on multiple entities. You might have a handler on many rows. You might have multiple requests open. You want to combine those bits of data. How do you do that exactly? And we're getting to that. I just, we have to make a little diversion on the way because I have to talk about variable scoping in JavaScript, so any of this will make sense. 
So, one of the other things that functional programming languages are notable for is lexical scoping. The scope of your variables depends on the scope of the, the block that contains them. And so they're quite strict about that. Your variables, unlike in say Python, don't just keep hanging around later so that you can see them lying around getting in the way. They go away as soon as they reach the end of their scope. They don't exist until the start of their scope. JavaScript scoping is almost lexical scoping. It, it's functional scoped. So a, a variable exists in the scope of the function that it's defined in. And there's some quite odd behavior. For a start, functions, when they're declared that way, are promoted to the top so that that function bar is actually defined at the top of the function even though it's written at the bottom of the function. That's a little odd. If you declare it the other way, then it's defined at the top of the function, but it hasn't been set yet. And that's something that breaks people's brains the first time they see this code quite often. So I just thought I'd mention it. It's just a strange little side effect of the way it works. The, the var declaration there, the saying this is a variable, is promoted up to the top, but the setting it to something isn't. So it has the value undefined, which is not the same as being not defined. And it's not the same <laughs> as being null. I hope that's all very clear. <laughs> I hope it's clear why you write Haskell now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the nice thing is, is that if a variable is still in scope when you call an inner function, a function that's defined within a function, it's still available to you when you call that inner function. This is a concept called closure. So the variable is kind of captured. I've made up this inner function. There was a variable in scope at the time I made it up. If I return that inner function from the outer function, then that captured variable will stay in existence. I can still do things with it. This is really, really cool. If you try to do that in C, you'll segfault every time and make a huge mess of your memory. And then you'll get a bug named after you with a cool logo. <laughs> but if you do it in JavaScript, it works. So you can actually now use that captured variable. You can call inner function. It can change that captured variable. So in this case, I've managed to leave one line out, which is that outer function should be returning inner function. And then I can call inner function, and each time it will increment that captured variable. I can't see the captured variable. It's been encapsulated. It's been captured. So that's a really important concept. We can use it to do a bit like our thing. And I've, I've gone a bit super primitive here so as to, to make sure everyone's brains don't bleed too much. But we could write a little sum function in the simplest possible JavaScript way by looping over our list of numbers and adding them all to the total. And, and everyone will have seen JavaScript that looks exactly like this, right? The big problem with this is we've now muddled up our concerns here. We've got a bit of a muddle between where are we adding, where are we looping. It would be very hard to change either part of that without touching the other part. We could also do it by taking that variable total and capturing it into that add to total function that I've highlighted up there, and then using like a for each loop to call that function over and over again, right? So for each value in the list of numbers, it's adding it to the total and then returning the total. It really doesn't look like we've achieved much, but we've separated out the for each behavior, the looping over a list, from the add behavior, just like we did before with reduce. Only this is slightly more flexible in some circumstances. We can also write functions that return functions, which I think is really the, where this stuff gets interesting. So we can say, let's, we, let's say our code raises things to powers a lot or does some particularly complicated function with things. We can write a function that remembers what power we want to do it to. And then when we use map on the function that that function returned, it will square every single number, right? So, sorry, the little closed brackets run off the right-hand side of the screen there, but we're basically saying we're writing a generic function called raise this to a power. And we're saying, okay, when you call raise to the power two, that will return a function that will raise a number to the power two, will square a number. So now if I want to calculate the sum of squares, instead of writing my own function every single time, let's say I want to calculate the sums of squares, sums of cubes, sums of etc. I just can use this raise to power thing as a helper. And this is another thing. Here we're getting little composable functions out of this process. And then I can add them all up with reduce, just like we did before. 
It's also quite handy if we, if we like the idea of having excesses on an object because we want to run that object through a map and pull out one particular element of that object over and over. If we have a list of users and we want to get all their shoe sizes, we can write an excessor for shoe size, an excessor for hack size, an excessor for that, and each time the map will call those and turn it from a list of users into a list of shoe sizes that we can then maybe graph or sort or do something with. It gets to be a bit of a pain if your structures get complicated. So instead we can write a little get property helper that will return a function that gets a property for you. There should also be some error handling code in here. I'm going to blame the size of my slides. It's run off the margins, honest. Um, and we can also do the same thing for sorting. Writing these sort functions over and over gets extremely tedious, so we can write a kind of generic sort function and then specialize it. This is actually what we've referred to previously in previous talks as currying. This is kind of related to partial application of, of this function. We're saying, well, I'm going to give you the first parameter, and you return me something that I can give the second parameter, and then we can go from there. All right. So we talked about asynchronous callbacks before, and I said, I'm going to leave you hanging on here, and now the asynchronous callbacks thing has returned, and now we can continue with asynchronous callbacks, because now you know what closures are. Closures are a really great way to handle asynchronous callbacks. Because remember before I was saying, you get a callback, how do you know what you needed, what caused it, what you needed to know? One way is you could stash stuff off in the DOM, and this is in fact encouraged by uh, jQuery, which is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, or you could stash it in a global variable, which is just as bad, but a library doesn't do it, so therefore people might defend it, who knows. You shouldn't do either of those things because your function that you're getting called as a callback can be closed over, it can capture some data. So if you know that someone, if you want to use the same callback on 15 little buttons, or the same piece of code can handle 15 little buttons, you make a little closure, 15 little closures, one for each little button, and tell the button call this closure. That closure then captures what ID it's talking about or what row it needs to talk about, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really, really simple technique. Once you, the first time you see it, you look at it and you go, what the hell are these people doing to me? As soon as you get the pattern, you realize how much cleaner it makes your code and how you no longer have to do all these horrible, horrible data things. All right. So, when we have one of these asynchronous events though, let's say we want to return something from an asynchronous event. We can't do this. We can't say, yeah, go and do something asynchronous for me and then when that happens, call me back. Because, hang on, this isn't gonna work. By the time I, I say look up name, it says go do something asynchronously, then it returns. What's it returning? Hang on, it's not ready to return anything yet. Oh, whoops. And when it does have the result, where does it return it to? We've lost it. This is where we get into callbacks, which is kind of continuation passing style as well. It's saying, go do this thing for me. When you're finished, call me back at this function. So you pass callbacks around a lot to say, like, go do this. When you get back to me, do that. So this is a really common thing you'll see as a, a uh, a way of handling Ajax calls, a way of handling buttons, a way of handling all of these sorts of things. There's one problem with it, which is when you have to suddenly do something, yep, when you suddenly have to do something else. You go, I've got a, a first lookup, now I'm gonna call a second lookup. You go, that's kind of awful, but I guess I'll live with it. Then someone says, no, no, we need to do a third lookup. And you go, okay, that's a little bit awful, but I guess it's almost lunchtime. And then someone says, but there's a fourth lookup. And you go, oh, I can't really do this, can I? The nice thing about uh, JavaScript is it is very, very flexible. So you could write your own little function called something like run in series that takes a list of functions, knows how to call each one, each one finishes, calls this function back, calls back its little inner callback. And then the inner callback says, okay, now call the next guy. Now call the next guy. I no longer have this horrible diagonal stack of functions running across the screen. I've now got a neat little list of I want you to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and now go do something else. You're finished, right? You can also choose to run them in parallel, which is a nice thing. If we're doing Ajax calls out to different services, you might want to run stuff in parallel. You've got all these tasks, they're asynchronous. Why not do them all at one time, overlapping? 
So that gives you abilities to do that. And once you've written this function once and tested it, it's there forever. You can now call any kinds of functions in parallel. It's pretty easy to write a thing that says run up to four of them in parallel. If you're dealing with a database that has a limited number of resources, you want to get some parallelization of your calls, but not so much that your system's administrators like phone you personally at night time. Then you can make it call like up to four, and as soon as the first one's finished, the fourth one or the fifth one gets queued, and then when the second one finished, the sixth one gets queued, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite easy to write, it's quite easy to test because it, you've composed it down to its own little function that calls other functions to do actually the work. All right, we can also do object stuff. I was talking about prototype OO before and saying I didn't really like it very much. If you really have to do object encapsulation for some reason, you can actually do that with closures as well rather than using the prototype encapsulation. I'm gonna sort of fast forward through that because we don't have a lot of time and it's not actually the most interesting bit I don't think. You can even do inheritance of object classes and stuff like that in a, in a kind of a way with that. And it works quite well and it's slightly lighter than the regular prototype inheritance. You can also do partial application if you're feeling like being really, really fancy and say, I'm gonna give you this, I'm gonna take a normal function, give you this many parameters now, I'll give you the rest later, give me a function that will do half the job for me. And you can write lazy, iterable things. So you can write things that are, are going to generate I call you once, I get an iterator, now I call it again and again and again and again until I'm finished and get my results. It does a little bit of computation each time. Um, these are really useful concepts when you're trying to make your code, as I say, separate the concerns from here is the thing that generates the numbers, from here is the thing that consumes the numbers. All right, I'm not even gonna talk about that, but I am gonna end on a, a terrible warning note, which is my, Carth furthermore, Carthage must be destroyed. JavaScript objects are not dictionaries, and I'm just warning everybody about this because I like to finish anything I say about JavaScript with this. There are a couple of major problems with pretending they're dictionaries. They have reserved words as keys. There is a reserved word called constructor that think objects have. If we try to count our words, we happen to have used the word constructor. Constructor in every object is a function, native code. So, we've suddenly made a huge mess of our histogram of words because one of our words has the count, the string, function, object, blah, 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 with a one stuck on the end. This is not a nice feature. It will hurt you, especially if you do something like this, where you say, well, let's compile a dictionary of all of the admin's names, and we'll say, if you're an admin, we'll let you do something. And then they say, well, my name's has own property. Hi, has in, in property, you're a member of this list. So this is a very bad, bad thing you should not do. Um, there are a couple of solutions to this in various libraries and I've written like a tiny, tiny little one which is there on the link, which if you happen to like very, very small libraries you might like. Um, right, so in conclusion, JavaScript may be awful indeed, but it's also kind of awesome in that it lets you do lots and lots and lots of different things. If you're going to write JavaScript, it might as well be awesome JavaScript because that way you'll be able to live with yourself. And unfortunately, the language doesn't actually distinguish between the two categories for you, so you're gonna have to do it yourself. So thank you very much and I hope to, uh, you will all write more awesome JavaScript as a result. <laughs>